Well, my sister was brave enough to do this. I think I have to try as well. We've always been a little competitive, so. <sighs> you all look beautiful. The greatest decision my father ever made was choosing to follow Christ. The second greatest decision my father ever made was marrying my mother, Linda. She had the exact right recipe of grace and faithfulness to act as a counterpoint to his sometimes contradictory meanderings. <laughs> she was always an anchor for him and for our family. I'm going to greatly miss them as the dynamic duo, Ross and Linda, mom and dad. Mom, I love you so much. On behalf of my family, my mother Linda, my sisters Tannis and Andrea, my brother-in-law Jubal, my niece and nephew Hannah and Caleb, I would like to thank you all for the amazing outpouring we have received over these past several days and weeks. Thank you for your fellowship, for the nourishment you've given both physically and spiritually, and above all for your prayers. You are all a shining example of what a Christian body can and should be. And we are more than blessed to consider St. James our home, which it has now been for over 20 years. It's fitting then that we gather here today in this home to celebrate my father's life and to offer him up a fond and jubilant farewell as he moves into his final home with our Father in heaven. I take great joy in knowing that he has already settled into the Lord's library with a stack of books <laughs> and a box of Milky Way chocolate bars. Uh, and that his incredible thirst for knowledge is being satiated in ways he could never even dream of. This voracious appetite for knowledge is a trait of my father's that will always stick with me. It was ever present. It bled into every aspect of his life. Everyone who's been up here has said it. My father had a brilliant mind. He was a seeker of truth, and his journey to find it, while sometimes appearing chaotic from an outside perspective, was in fact methodical and well-documented. It was so well-documented, in fact, that as my sister mentioned, my father leaves behind a veritable treasure trove of boxes full of scratch paper, note cards, journals, books upon books with extensive notes and monologues scribbled into the margins. My father's typical clothing consisted of slacks and an Oxford shirt, in the left breast pocket of which he would keep a pen or two, as well as a handful of three by five note cards perhaps a small notebook or some old receipts, all of which were primed to be written on at a moment's notice. <laughs> no blank piece of paper was ever safe around him, and it was, it was within arm's reach. It would not take long until it was filled with thoughts about things he had heard, read, seen, or felt, all of which were then carried back to our home at the end of the day and filed away. Excuse me. As my sister said, we knew that my father had been sick for some time. At the end of June, we thought we, we might lose him. We were blessed to have been given three more months with him. Once my father returned home from the hospital in July, he decided it was time to start going through these boxes. This was a major undertaking and quickly began to take over the house. There were stacks of boxes in the kitchen. There were stacks of boxes in the living room. There were stacks of boxes surrounding his chair. Stacks of paper filling up the armrests, balancing precariously in well-organized piles that only made sense to him. Stacks of boxes on the fireplace of things that had already been sorted through, but only in a logic that he understood. This was the state of the house when we returned from the hospital Saturday evening. This was a bit of a shock for me as I had flown directly from New York City that night and gone straight from the airport to the hospital. 
Seeing the traces of so many aspects of my father's life stacked in front of me shook me to the core. While nothing could have prepared me for walking into his hospital room that night, the reality waiting for me at home was somehow the more difficult thing to attempt to comprehend. These boxes represented his life. Their being out in the open meant he was in the process of making sense of them. And now he was not coming back to finish the job. That night, my mom and my sister and I had a tearful and restless night. After coffee and some morning fellowship, my sister decided she should go home and shower and check in on her family, then return later to engage in some spelunking of photo albums and reminiscing. Once my sister left, my mother and I just sat at the kitchen table next to three stacks of boxes, completely shell-shocked. After several moments, my mom asked if I would be offended if she put in a load of laundry. I said, of course not. But then I stopped her and I said, you know, this is going to be a long week. And I think things will feel easier for us if we can restore some sort of order to the living areas. Can we move these boxes out of sight just until next week and then we can pick up where he left off? She gave a sigh of relief and said, yes, I would like that very much. Still in my pajamas and under her direction, I began to slowly shuffle boxes out to the garage where some of them had come from. The concrete was cold. Why don't you put some shoes on? Well, I only brought my one pair of boots. Well, would you find it weird to wear your father's house shoes, my mom asked. I think that would actually be very comforting. So we went to their bedroom to find his slippers. We only found one. I, I, I joked that he must have taken the other one with him. <laughs> so, in place of that, my mother offered me a pair of his thick, cozy socks instead. I placed them eagerly and tenderly on my feet. And now, this is not an exaggeration. I was immediately filled with a rush of warmth, with goose flesh, with butterflies, it was suddenly as if I was receiving the hug from my father that I'd so desperately been craving the night before in the hospital. I suddenly felt as if a small piece of me was in heaven with him. My father had impeccable taste in socks. <laughs> now, I've been wearing that same pair all week, and I'm still wearing them today. So back in the garage with my feet covered, I was at first working diligently to make a dent in the stacks of boxes, but as the piles diminished, and as I was joined by my nephew, and then my brother-in-law, and then my sister, I began to start looking through various slips of paper, note cards, books, and as I did, it was as if, it was as if my father had strategically placed certain items where I would come across them as if he was speaking directly to me through his long lost notes, as if they had been written down years ago for this exact moment, and for this exact purpose. Some were from the 1970s, some were from the 1980s, some were from the 1990s, some were from just a few months ago. I felt as if I was being struck by lightning repeatedly. It was a special series of moments and I will remember them forever. Some of them I'll keep to myself to cherish alone for years to come. Others I would like to share with you now. So, we're all here to celebrate a life well lived. To say my father was a great man would be an understatement. He was so much more than great. He was so many different things to so many different people. He was a father to more than just my sisters and I. He was a grandfather to more than just my niece and nephew and my own surrogate daughter, Hannah. He had so many surrogates. He was a brother in Christ to all who shared his love of the Lord. He was a mentor, a colleague, a friend, a teacher, but above all else, he was a student. It was this constant exploration and chronicling of the world around him, both physical and spiritual, that always fascin fascinated me most about my father. 
And here I was in the midst of the fruit of years of study. As I sat in the living room reveling in my father's gems of research and observations, I realized I was going to have to prepare something to share today. I started to panic. I thought to myself, how? How? How can I take a thousand facets of a secret relationship known only to just the two of us and create a clear and visible window for others to look into? How, how am I supposed to attempt to describe someone who meant so much to me? At first I thought I just might bring a dictionary and, um, and just begin reciting all the favorable adjectives I came across, <laughs> starting with A and ending with Z. Even if I had done that at the end of it all, we still would not have captured the essence of this man who is Ross Taylor. And so just as I was abandoning the idea of describing him, I pulled this card from a stack of papers. It says fervent. And it literally lists the entire definition of the word in all its forms and uses. Fervent. From the Latin fervens, to be hot, to boil, to glow, to be ardent, earnest, excited, animated, glowing, vehement. Well, okay. So my father was fervent. When he was excited about something, he did sort of boil over. He did glow. He certainly had a certain glow about him that we all responded to. He did burn hot. He was extraordinarily passionate and incredibly earnest. And when he believed in something, he could be quite vehement. My father lived his life with fervor. I'll carry this card with me to remind me to make attempts to do the same. The next card I came across was this. One single quote. Consider how hard it is to change yourself, and you'll understand what little chance you have to change others. This resonated with me, and it obviously resonated with my father since he wrote it down and held on to it. I want him to know in this moment that while he may not have been able to change himself, that his chances of changing other people were exceedingly great, that every person in this room is here because in some way or another he touched their lives and changed them. The last thing I want to share is this. My father was a fervent reader. It was not uncommon for him to have five or six books in the works at one time. This is one of the last books he was reading. And it was the book he asked my mother to bring to the hospital for him when he went there last Wednesday. For those who can't read it from where they're sitting, it's An Invitation to Solitude and Silence by Ruth Haley Barton. My mother asked me if I would like it, and I said yes. We began discussing it as well as what he had highlighted. As Dane says, he highlighted things once, twice, three times. Um, and then we started reading the notes he scribbled in the margins. He'd only read the first chapter, but already his insights were incredible. As we all said earlier, my father had a brilliant mind. Upon reading the, the, the passage, God's invitation is an invitation from his very heart to the depths of our being. It warrants, it warrants serious consideration because it's an invitation to a journey, a quest really, for something we have been longing for all our lives. The journey requires a willingness to say goodbye to life as we know it because our heart is longing for something more. Because our heart is longing for something more. Without skipping a beat or referencing a scripture, he jots in the margin the words, eternity in our hearts. And he notates Ecclesiastes 3.11. I am thankful and able to, re to be able to rejoice today because I know my father found his eternity. 
After talking with my mother, I poured over the entirety of chapter one that night. I found myself reading things that he had underlined over and over again. I would like to leave you with the closing lines of chapter one, which he underlined with emphasis. We are starved for mystery to know this God as one who is totally other and to experience reverence in his presence. We are starved for intimacy to see and feel and know God in the very cells of our beings. We are starved for rest to know God beyond what we can do for him. We are starved for quiet to hear the sound of the sheer silence that is the presence of God himself. The invitation to solitude and silence is an invitation to all of this and the beauty of an invitation is that we really do have a choice. We can say yes or no. God extends the invitation, but he honors our freedom and will not push in where he is not wanted. Instead, he waits for us to respond from the depths of our desire. When your invitation comes, I pray you will say yes. My father said yes. And because he said yes, everything changed. We've all been changed of his one, because of his one simple yes. And now, even the things he couldn't change about himself, they've now been changed. God has changed them because of the word yes. I love you, Dad. I'm, I'm really going to miss you. And even though I know no matter how many of your pairs of socks I might put on, I know I, nev I will never be able to fill your shoes. I just want you to know that I'll be doing my best to follow in your footsteps so that I might see you again in heaven. I'm, I'm saying yes, fervently. Thanks. When I consider Ross's ear for music and his love of written words, it means something extra to be told that he liked the song that I wrote. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and so um, the song that uh, I'm going to do uh, is called Alpha Omega, and it's a song about the fullness of God's kingdom, the place where things are fully as they should be, and one day fully will be. Uh, and it's humbling to be asked to sing it. First, I just wanted to uh, play one part of a, a, of a different song. Um, I'm, I'm releasing a, an album, my first singer-songwriter album, uh, this next week, <coughs> supported by the Taylors. Um, and on it, there just so happens to be a song that in the liner notes is dedicated to the Taylors. And it's called We Faithful. And it's about hope during times that remind us that our journey of faith moves us towards fullness, uh, but we've not yet fully arrived. Uh, time waits today. So I could say so much about Ross, but I'm here to sing, and so many people have said such wonderful things. I just want to say that uh, I've been so blessed by Ross. Uh, I really miss him. And I'm glad that he's fully arrived. If this 
this harvest takes to bring life. If this harvest takes to oh, on the way I, I felt it like regret. And Jesus said to his disciples, I want you to see Dr. Ross Taylor in these verses. If anyone would come after me, he must, three things, deny himself. That doesn't mean do without a meal or ice cream. It means, as Jesus says in another scripture passage, die to yourself. Make God the first place in your life, not your buddy, but your God, your Lord. That's to deny yourself. 
Not on Sundays only, not on Christmas and Easter, but every moment of every day. He's either Lord or He's not. He must deny Himself and take up His cross. The disciple Luke says take up His cross daily. That's a life of sacrifice as it talks about the cross for Christ died for us. Gave his life that we might live, that we might know what it is to be free of the guilt of sin and shame. I suggest to you that that is the big piece of Ross's legacy to us as family and friends. It's a wonderful thing, and I was prepared to share some of those thoughts myself about his brilliant mind and his reading and his notes, our travels to Israel and such, watching him there at the Dead Sea giggle and laugh as Ron Sumter smeared mud all over him. Dylene and Jerry Crockett sitting in here referring to him as Rocket Man over there because he had two water bottles attached to his little pack on his waist. But I tell you as his pastor, his great legacy to all of us is why we're here. His life poured into us. He was the kind of physician that cared about his patients, not just that they get well. And it bothered him. I listened to him as Dan Tyner did about how he was concerned when a patient wasn't getting well and whatever. They were not just a case, but a person for whom he prayed, not only before he met with them and as he met with them, but long after that God might work a miracle in their life. You see, I'm persuaded he understood the Hippocratic Oath that we in the, or those of you in the medical profession are only nursemaid to healing. We're thankful for you, but only God can heal. And Ross was persuaded that only God could heal the the whole person, body, soul, and spirit. That it's not just about the physical flesh, but it's about the whole person. That if any one piece was out of joint, it affected all of the others. That was him, an amazing man. And we're all here because he poured his life into us. I've been doing hospital visitation for more than 30 years now, and I have never had the experience that I had last Wednesday as he was going to have his procedure. When I didn't know there were so many people that worked over at the Cancer Treatment Center of America, and I don't know what all roles they had, but there were doctors and nurses, and and there was just a crowd in there hugging on him, loving him, praying for him, having their picture made with him. They're out in the hallway there, and he was just in what we in Texas would go, maybe Arkansas would call hog heaven. It meant something to him, you know? That's what this take up your cross is. It's pouring your life into other people. Whether it's those that work with you on staff or nursing staff or administrative staff or pathetic little old preachers. He was one of my earliest friends here. In fact, he was the first person that ever called me from here. He was the chairperson of our staff parish relations committee. That's the the human resources committee. But you know, that wasn't his last call. It seemed like every week he would call and say, do you have time to go get something to drink? Do you want something to eat? And he would always say, how are you doing? 
I've got to admit, He gave me more care than I gave Him. And I'm ashamed to say that, but I learned from Him. And then He'd say, how are you doing really? When I say, I'm all right. How are you doing really? It was like He had a way of reading my heart. And and it was simply that He cared. He cared. That's why we're here. That's taking up your cross. And, and following me, Jesus says, that's the third element of the Christian life. Deny yourself. Put God first in your life. Take up your cross. Others come first. And follow me into places that, that don't always offer great reward. We got stuck down in Roca Blanca, the mission base in Mexico, south of Acapulco, when 9-11 happened here in the United States. I was about to go insane, thinking life was over, I'd never get home. Ross was in his element. Now, he had his wife there, I didn't. But there was a person that couldn't afford a doctor. I remember Ross's joy, and you will too, Linda that they had for some little while had stepped on a a bone of a fish and it had gone into that person's foot and become infected. And Ross said, well, it's been a long time since I've really done any cutting and surgical stuff. It wasn't about money. It wasn't about profession. It was a person there, a person that Ross reached out to got that fishbone out, got that foot dressed. And it's in those experiences of dying to self and carrying your cross and following Christ where sometimes you're uncomfortable going that you see God. That you see God. And you experience the abundant life. You don't experience that just going to church and sitting in a chair. I learned so much from him. Jesus continues. You didn't know he said all that, did you? For whoever wants to save his life will lose it. They'll die to their own self-interest, to their own selfishness, to themselves. It's others that count. But whoever loses his life for me will find it What good will it be for a man if he gains the whole world, yet forfeits his soul? Or what can a man give in exchange for his soul? For the Son of Man, here it is, for the Son of Man is going to come in his Father's glory with his angels. And then he will, it's a promise, not he might, he will reward each person. He will reward Ross Taylor according to what he has done with the heart of Christ. You see, life is going somewhere. We live in a fatalistic society. So many see life ending at at death, but the scripture would say it doesn't end at all. Jesus is saying there is still an accountability with God for each one of us. And he's saying for those who have denied themselves, taken up their cross and followed him, the master Jesus, there is a reward. I want to, in closing, read you a piece of it. It includes the text, the only one that the family actually requested. And it's pretty, it's about reward. And it's God's promise to Ross and all who believe. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there was no longer any sea. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Now the dwelling of God is with men, and He will live with them. They will be His people, 
And God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain. For the old order of things has passed away. He who was seated on the throne said, I am making everything new. Then he said, write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. He said to me, it is done. I am Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To him who is thirsty, Ross Taylor, I will give to drink without cost from the spring of the water of life. He who overcomes, Ross Taylor, will inherit all of this, and I will be his God, and he will be, not might be, not maybe, I'll think about it, he will be my son, my son. So certainly today, There's an empty place in our hearts. There is in mine. Someone needs to say it on behalf of the church. Ross and Linda Taylor have helped St. James Church be what we are as St. James Church. Not just in their attendance. Ross has taught here. They've modeled what it is to be husband and wife. Faithful to God. He's been on many of our committees that has moved us forward. In my earlier time here, he was instrumental. When we were a million dollars in debt, more than, saying, what about missions? Don't you think that God would bless a church like he would bless an individual who invests themselves back in missions? And we took off. And today we spend nearly $500,000 in missions because someone included in a group of people named Dr. Ross Taylor found that flame. And I am grateful. Now there's others that I could name, but today is Ross's day. We are, as a church, and I'd want you to know that, His stamp is all over. It's not a stamp of control. Some people want to control the church. No, his dreams are all among us. And we, like you as a family, will continue to walk those out. In fact, you don't know it as family, I'll share it with you. One of his physician mentors, Dr. Haney Collada, living in Cairo, Egypt. We just, in our budget, approved new for him $6,000 a year in support. You see, his life has touched lives. And for that I give thanks. Because as he met God, God wasn't going to brag on him because of his degrees, because of his brilliant mind, because of boxes in the garage and all of those are important I'm not diminishing but important to God is what did you do with my Jesus my son and what did you do with your life and as I know Ross and I talk important to him was each of those his love for God and his passion for wanting to make a difference in the lives of other people and bring them hope Let's pray, and then we're going to sing. Are are we going to sing, or just you going to sing? Do we have words on the screen? Okay, we're going to sing a a rip snort and go out. This is supposed to be a celebration, not a hangdog thing. And uh, eat, is that what you're saying? Uh, We got enough for everyone? All right, I'm a little nervous up here, but uh, on behalf of the family and also I have seen, I want to share my gratitude to Cancer Treatment Centers of America because of their willingness also to be involved in catering here. 
If you have time, everyone in here is welcome to share lunch with us in the dining room when we finish. It'll be in the furthest corner back that direction. And we'll also have a mic set up there that if you haven't had a chance to share a memory, just step up to that mic. It'll be live and uh, you share your heart. Let's pray. God, we thank you for the life, the witness, the beauty of Dr. Ross Taylor among us in a variety of different ways. We're richer because he has lived. And we're richer still because of his hope in Christ in a place called heaven, which only believers can call home. Gives us hope today, God, that he's wonderfully whole and fully alive in your presence, experiencing your full and great reward. So we pray for his family. We pray for his family. It's right that... uh, They, maybe more so than any of us, feel that sense of loss. But you promised to come and fill the void. Not to take his place, but when need be, to pick them up and carry them forward. To remind them that they too have an eternal outlook and hope. May they stay focused and remember who they are. That in some ways, Lord, not only you, but the legacy of Dr. Ross Taylor would be alive in them. In Jesus' name, amen. You need to stretch anyway. Let's stand as we uh, rip snore. him everything he knows. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you, turn his face toward you, and give you his peace, his shalom. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen. God bless you. Thank you for being here. Hope you can stay for lunch.